Well, it's good to be back in the Lord's house again this evening. Amen. See your smiling faces here again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a blessing. We are uh, 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 talking about music in the churches, and of course down south, you know, a lot of the church has been taken over by a lot of unscriptural music. And I don't use the word contemporary too much because contemporary just means mostly modern. It's either scriptural, it's unscriptural. And uh, I don't know if I've told you not, my pastor, uh, Brother Jeff, and uh, Brother Drew Ray at Antioch Baptist Church, and several others are working on a new hymn book. And the hymn book is going to be about 1,200 songs. And uh, they should have it done somewhere around 2013. This hymn book is going to incorporate all the old songs that you don't find in any hymn books today that the Baptists wrote. And many of them have been squelched over the years. They've been uh, obscured, uh, been done away with, been destroyed, burned. I don't know if you're aware of, but a lot of our Baptist history was burned, and uh, along with the uh, Baptists themselves. But, for instance, the song, Crown Him With Many Crowns, most hymn books has about five verses for that song. That song has ten verses. And what Brother Jeff and Brother Drew and several of the other men have gone back and done, they have recovered those lost verses. Now you say, well, that's a lot of verses to sing. But well, think about it just a minute. What if you were to write a song, and you wrote a song that glorified the Lord from start to finish, and it was like a story. Each verse was set up from beginning to end, and somebody decided they wanted to eliminate four or five of your verses. Would you be kindly disposed toward them for doing that? Probably not, but that's what's happened over the years. And so, uh, this uh, hopefully this hymn book will be out sometime around 2013. I've even worked a little bit on it with uh, the scripture references. But uh, they, they have been painstakingly recovering these songs and writing the music for them or recovering the music, just as it was. And, uh, and adding verses and deleting verses. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but the last verse that we sing of Amazing Grace, and we've been there, been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, was not written by John Newton. It was written by Augustine. And it was, it was put in that song, that, that something that he wrote, and we're talking about back in 450 AD. So, but there are three or four more verses in Amazing Grace that no hymn book has in it. And uh, like I say, when we get to heaven, I would hate to have to face these brothers and sisters in Christ uh, having took, took out four or five of their verses or more. And so, many of the songs are tremendous. I mean, they're absolutely tremendous. Uh, full of scripture, full of doctrine, full of Bible. And so hopefully you pray about that project that they'll get it to the press as quickly as possible, get it done. I don't know where they're at now as far as uh, the number of songs to go in it, probably up around a thousand. But there's many more to go, a lot of work to do, and it's going to be a real thick hymn book. But they're going to sell it, you know, it's, it's just to recover the cost for the printing. And so uh, we'll try to keep you informed on that and let you know if you're interested because uh, most modern hymn books today have been streamlined uh, to the nth degree, and it's really, it's really distressing. It's really a problem, especially if you know our heritage and uh, the, the, the Baptists that died to give you the privilege you have to sit on these pews. Yes. I mentioned that this morning. Well, let's take your Bible this evening and turn to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. Now, I prayed about what to bring this evening, and the Lord said, "This is." What he wants me to give, yeah, he'll come down and speak audibly to me, but he speaks in my heart about uh, what he wants me to bring, and I hope it'll be a blessing and encouragement to you. I had a, uh, a good time preaching this morning, had a lot of liberty here, and I thank the Lord for that, and that's just a sign that you've had the Word of God preached here, and that's, that's good. I mean, you go to some churches, and they'll look at you like a, a calf looking at a new gate, and, uh, and you know, you can tell they don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, you can tell when the folks have been reading the Bible, and I, I like what you do here reading the scripture. I had a Catholic priest tell us one time, a group of us Baptists, 
that there's more Bible read in the Catholic Church than there is in most Baptist churches. Now, what they call Bible, and you know what that is, that's either the Child of Rings or the, either the Confraternity ed Edition or the New American Bible, all your Catholic translations, or your Jerusalem Bible, 1966. They're not Bibles, they're perversion. But you know, he struck a nerve with us men, and we uh, started doing more Bible reading in the church. Never let it be said that, uh, that a Baptist would fall short to anyone of reading the scriptures in the church. Amen. So I appreciate you doing that and the way you do it. He yeah, has sound like he has some acting uh, uh, experience, <laughs> which I like. That's the reason I like to listen to Alan Scorby uh, because of his, he's an accomplice, was an accomplished actor. And Scorby said himself, he said, I thank God that I recorded the King James Bible. Amen. He said, because it is the word of God. So he was a saved man who's now gone to heaven. So I, I appreciate Alexander Scorby. Amen. Especially when I can't pronounce words and I saw I listened to him and find out how to pronounce them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nehemiah chapter number four. The Bible says, now, before I read this, remember that Babylon had held Israel in captivity, the two southern tribes, for 70 years. And they began to come back in the land after that captivity. The, two, the ten northern tribes went into captivity in Assyria in, in, in 746 B.C. And the two southern tribes followed suit in about 606 to 586 B.C. And what you have here, the narrative you find in Nehemiah is when Ezra and Nehemiah and all them, they didn't come back all at one time. They came back in, like, with years. It took uh, a, a long time for them to go into captivity. They weren't taken into captivity all at one time. As a matter of fact, the two southern tribes started about 606, and it took about 586 for them to all get out of Israel and went into captivity into Babylon. But what we're finding here, picking up, most of your tribes of the ten northern tribes didn't come back to the land of Israel. They were scattered all over the world. But the southern tribes, about uh, 49,000, did come back in captivity out of Babylon. And so this is what we're picking up here in the book of Nehemiah. They came back to the land and already started having trouble. <laughs> there must have been a bunch of Jewish badness, something I can figure. <laughs> but anyway, notice that we pick up in verse number four. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria, and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of the rubbish which are burned? He was talking about making an end. Will they, will they undo what 70 years of captivity has done to this land? That's what he's saying. He's mocking them, making fun of them like we say when I, when I was a kid, you're making fun of people or teasing them. I didn't ever say tease. I said, you're making fun of me. All right? Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah, and the Arabians, and the uh, Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Now that's a good message in there. Right there in that verse, I have a message as a matter of fact. Uh, when you wonder why sometimes your pastor has to preach against certain things, well, it's not his fault. It's their fault. <laughs> I mean, he wouldn't have to preach it if people would behave themselves. About you got to preach what's out here in the world. If you're a red-blooded American man and you can't get angry about what's going on in this country, then something is seriously wrong. Yeah. Folks, there's nothing wrong 
with being angry and sinning not. There's nothing wrong with righteous indignation. Our Lord got angry, but he had a cause. Yeah. All right? Now notice, that is if you've got a King James Bible. Now if you've got an NIV without a cause is left out of Matthew uh, chapter 5, 22, so you make Christ a sinner. Amen? Another reason to dump the NIV, turn your NIV into BTUs. Amen? <laughs> All right? <laughs> And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there's much rubbish, so that we are not able to build a wall. And our adversaries said, They shall not know neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I to set the people with their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers, to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, the bows, and the haberdashers, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. How about that? For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side and so built it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me and I said to the noble, to the rulers, to the rest of the people, the work is great and large and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place therefore you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work. And half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise at the same time said out of the people, let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. So neither I nor my brethren nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes saving that everyone put them off for washing. Father, give us wisdom now as we look to your word. As we make this spiritual application today, we pray, Lord, that your blessed will be done and you'll help as I try to preach this message. I'm a needy creature here tonight, Father. I stand in a place where no man stands alone. And I pray you'll help me tonight. Clothe me with my calling. Help me to be plain. Help me to be uh, 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 what I should be Christ-like as I preach. And I'll thank you and praise you for what you do. Lord, I pray that your blessing will be done tonight. And whoever needs this message, we pray, Lord, you'd speak to every heart. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the greatest weapons that Satan will use today against the local church is division. Mm -hmm. Causing division. Now, I don't know anything about this church, but I know churches. I know Baptist churches. Like I said this morning, I was born at night, but not last night. I've been a, in a Bible-believing Baptist church now since, uh, well, I was raised in Southern Baptist churches when I was a very small boy and got out of church until I got saved when I was 18. My wife and I got married in the Methodist church. I guess we're legally married. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I became an independent Baptist in 1976. And since that time, I've seen, yea, hundreds of Baptist churches. And I know what kind of problems goes on in church. I've even filled the pulpit as pastor in several churches. And, uh, well, like, well, filling in for a pastor, interim pastor, until they got a pastor. And so I know what kind of problems goes on in churches. Amen. I'm a member of a local church myself. And so the devil will try to bring division in churches to try to split up and cause the work to cease. And we want to see that. Would you believe that's right here in the book of Nehemiah? Hmm. That's what you call applying the scripture and it's not doing violence to the scripture. We're going to see that tonight. I want you to see a scriptural, a biblical case and a scriptural remedy for any problem that arises in a local Baptist church. How about that? 
Number one, I want you to see the people had a mind to work. Now, looking around here, I see y'all have no problem with that whatsoever. Amen. I can't believe what's been accomplished in four years. And this is just a, I've, I've laid my bed at night, you might think I'm kidding, and, and tried to envision what you folks were doing up here. Uh, how you were going to get the church in here and what you were going to do. And it's been such a blessing to see the fruition of that work. And, and, and like I say, folks had a mind to work. You say, where's that in the Bible? Well, look at chapter number four and verse number four. The Bible said, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall. And all the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Oh, that Baptists these days would have a mind to work, amen? I mean, work is a four-letter word, but it's not a bad four-letter word. Like I heard a black preacher say one time, he said, my mom and dad taught me some four-letter words, like wash and work. And he said, iron. <laughs> I say iron. They don't say, I always say iron. He said, iron. <laughs> to the poor little word. I was taught those when I was a kid. My mama taught me, made me wash dishes. My brother and I, when we were coming up, and we didn't have any sisters. <laughs> so instead of watching NFL football pregame show on Sunday, we had to wash the dishes. And I hated that. Oh, Lord, I hated that. And I told my brother, I said, I wish you were a girl. <laughs> But I'm done the washing and do the drying. We had to get them done. And when my dad said, boys, get these dishes and wash them, we didn't wrinkle our face up. No, 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 not with Grady Canuck. I didn't wrinkle my face. I didn't, I didn't even get a mad look on my face because I knew what would happen. I washed the dishes. And I'm still alive. It didn't kill me. Amen. I got dishpan hands, but I got over it. Amen. But Baptists need a mind to work. Amen. 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 Now you go out here and you see these kingdom halls that Jehovah's Witnesses put up. They all come in, join together, and volunteer work, and they get them things springing up all over the place. It's a shame that a Jehovah's Witness, a Russellite, would have more of a mind to work than the average Baptist, but that's, what, that's what's going on. Amen. Now look at this. You always have someone that thought they were a little bit above it. Turn back one chapter, look in chapter 3. Now, I have no idea before you start. I know how the devil works. Before the devil tries to tap you on your shoulder and say, Brother Mitch is wondering who did the work here. And I don't know. I know Brother Ireland has because he's a builder. And I know that. And the wood work. And I brought him, man, I brought him about, I mean, 50 bottles of glue, wood glue. <laughs> and, uh, and brand spanking new, just ready to go. And uh, I've sent him some before, instead of sending it in the mail, I just brought it with me. I have some friends I went to church with that worked at the Elmer's Glue Factory. And the bottles, they had the labels put on wrong, they gave them to them. So they gave me, I mean, I bet you they gave me 150 bottles. And so I've sent him some, and now he's got a whole, he's ready to go now for a while. Amen. Amen. So I know he's done some good work. Amen. And she'll have plenty for him to do. Amen. <laughs> My daddy did woodwork and my mother would take the house and garden magazines and she'd see a picture in there and she'd get a magnifying glass and look at it, show it to my daddy and he'd build it. How about that? <laughs> Amen. That's a good idea. But look at chapter 3 now. Then Eliashim, the high priest, rose up with his breath and the priest and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it, set up the doors of it, even under the tower of Meah. They sanctified it under the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho. And next to them builded Zakur, the son of Imri. But the fish gate that the sons of Hassaniah built, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of of Berechiah, the son of Mehezbeel, and next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Baana, and next unto them that the Kohites repaired, but look at it, their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. How about that? 
And you know what happens when somebody don't do their part? Somebody else always has to take up the slack. That's why he said, moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Passiah, and Meshulam, the son of Besodeah. They laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, the bars thereof. Listen, somebody has to take up the slack. You know something, folks? There is no glory or prestige in repairing the old gate. Yeah. And there's some people, if they didn't get a pat on the back, they, they're just not going to do it. Or if they can't get some monetary gain, they're just not going to do it. You say, well, Brother Mitch, when you go to preach, uh, they give you a love offering. Folks, I've been to places, numbers of places, where I wound up not getting enough love offering to cover my gas expenses. I don't go for the money. Thank God for it. we got to buy groceries too. Amen. And we got bills like everybody else. But listen, God called me to preach not to receive an offering. Now don't keep your money because I said that. <laughs> But I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not for sale. I never have been and never will be. And I've been preaching now over 35 years. Now look at this. He said, the old gate repaired your order. Take your, take your Bible and flip over to Jeremiah 6. You know where I'm going with this. Jeremiah chapter 6. There's no recognition for repairing the old gate. Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 15. Jeremiah 6, 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast out, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see. And ask for the old paths, which is the good way. And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Now boy, that's, that's adamant, isn't it? Walk in the old paths. Repair the old gates. Build up the waste cities that's been burned with fire. They said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. So when somebody don't do it, somebody else always has to do it. If it gets done. My brother, my mom, my dad would tell my brother, he drove a truck. My dad drove a truck, so we had gumball trees in the yard, and I hate them things, sweet gum trees. And my dad said, all them gumballs in this yard, when I get home, they better be all up. So I'd go out there and go up and start getting them up, and I'd look for my brother, and he'd be playing with the dog. I said, boy, you better get over here. And he'd go ahead and work for a while, and he'd be playing with the dog. Finally, I said, this, just go on, I'll do it. And my mama said, Mitch, you're dumb. That's what he wants you to do. Don't you don't, can't figure that out yet. <laughs> but, uh, but then he'd get home and there'd still be some in the yard and we had to get mom to come out because the wind would blow some more down after we got those up. But I hated that. But I mean, uh, listen, I mean, I, 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 you got to get a, a work ethic. A work ethic. I believe a Christian and work go together. I believe that. But they said, we're not going to do it. We're not, we're not going to walk there. We're not going to seek the old paths. We're not going to walk the old way. We're not going to repair this gate. And there's a lot of Baptists that think these lights you'll know, pay for themselves. They don't. They don't. This, this heat that you've enjoyed is not paying for itself. Amen. Now listen. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 28 says, Remove not the ancient landmarks which our fathers have set. Have you ever stopped to think about what it would be for you and I today as independent Baptists if our forefathers had not had a mind to work? Yeah. We wouldn't have anything. Yeah. Folks, do you know there's independent Baptist churches all over this country sitting empty with the windows dark in them tonight? That's a shame. Brother and I was talking before the service about some of the old churches built in the 1700s and 1800s. And the Baptist History Preservation Society is getting many of them opened back up and getting putting pastors in there and getting congregations back in those buildings. Some of those buildings are uh, 300 years old or more. And they set there in a state of ruins. And people are now in them worshiping the Lord. People are getting saved. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Isn't that a blessing? But somebody's got to do the work. Somebody's got to do the work. In my church, my local church, we have a small church, but it's out in the middle of a lot of property. Our church owns about 50 acres of land, 
and our church sits on my pastor's dad's property. It's 120 acres of land. We've got plans to build a new building one of these days, hopefully. We try to be very careful about that. And, uh, and we, we, but it's going to take some work. It's going to take some sacrifice. Amen. And I'm not, you know, spring chicken anymore. I'm not as young as I used to be. I can't do what I used to, but I, I try to pitch in and do what I can. Amen. And it takes everybody to do that. Everybody. Amen. Now look at this. I want you to notice number two. First of all, people have a mind to work, but look at this right here. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. In Nehemiah chapter number 4, the Bible, I want, you to notice, I want you to notice the Bible tells us there was much rubbish to decay their strength. Look at this in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 10. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. You know what rubbish is? It's garbage. <laughs> it's refuse. It's waste. It's trash. Look at your Bible. Hold your hand right there and look over to Lamentations. Look at, look at the book of Lamentations. In Lamentations, chapter number four. You remember what old uh, uh, Sam Ballot said over there at Tobiah? They said, they're going to revive these stones out of the heaps of rubbish. Look at all this garbage in the way. How are they going to build this? What are they going to do? They had a mind to work. But look over in Lamentations. It's right after the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations. And look what the weeping prophet says about the city of Jerusalem. Lamentations. Chapter number 4. In verse number 12. Lamentations 4, 12. The Bible says this. Well, let me get over there. Hold on now. Here we go. In Lamentations 4, 12, he said, The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. For the sins of her prophets, and for the iniquities of her priests, they have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. Isn't that a terrible thing? People look at the churches nowadays that I never believe. I never believe that things have happened in Baptist churches the way they're happening today. We discussed that a little bit about the music, how it's gone downhill. And I'm talking about when you give up your King James Bible, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over again. When you give up this book, the music follows it. Amen. This book right here will not spawn the type of music that's being played in many churches today. Amen. That stuff strikes up. It don't have to play but one note, and I know what it is. I know exactly what it is. Thank God for your, your, your folk, your music. Thank God for it. Thank God. It's a blessing. I'm serious. Amen. I'm not trying to just pat you on the back. I don't just give compliments out for no reason. I'm telling you, folks, you, you've got the right foundation, and you stay with it. Amen. Stay with it. Stay behind your pastor. Stay with it. Refuse. Refuse to go the way of this world. Amen. Amen. The preacher said one time, the, 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 the duty of every Christian in every generation, are you listening, is to find the direction that the world is going and go the exact Amen. opposite. You know what's happening today? The world's going this way, and Christians are going this way, right with them. Mm -hmm. After all, we've got to reach the young people. You know what I was reached with? The gospel at the age of 18. Somebody gave me the gospel. That's what reached me. I didn't go to listen to some, uh, some Christian rock group. Mm -hmm. Christian rock. That's like, that's like Christian fornication. I mean, it's, it's, it just don't yeah. go together. It doesn't go together. Why don't you look at the scripture here now? If you think I'm, if you think I'm wrong, look back in our text. Look back in Nehemiah chapter 4. I want to show you. And this is what is going on in Baptist church. And maybe it's not going on up here in Pennsylvania. But it sure is in North Carolina. I want you to notice that first of all, 
He said, the strength of the bearers of birds is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. Now listen, when you're preoccupied with much rubbish, you hide the enemy. Look at verse 11. And our adversary said, they shall not know. What does that mean? In the local church, if you get out of the business of doing what a local church is supposed to do and start doing a, a bunch of things that, that, that are not scriptural, that doesn't matter, Satan can creep in and bring false doctrine in here and absolutely destroy this place. I've seen it over and over and over again. I've seen local churches in our area be taken over by Calvinism. I've seen local churches in our area be taken over by hyper-dispensationalism. And like I say, I'm a strong dispensationalist, and I don't deny that. I believe in rightly dividing the word. But folks, listen, you get out on a hyper, you get out on a you get out on a tangent somewhere, and Satan will destroy the church. And people will leave, and then the windows will be dark. You say, why? Because you won't know. You'll be so preoccupied with infighting that you won't see when the enemy comes through the door. You know what that pastor's job is? Wolf warfare. That's what his job is. Paul said, I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's the pastor's job. To detect that and, and make sure it stays out so it don't destroy the sheep. That's what a shepherd does. He protects the sheep. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. 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 This man's not a hireling. He's a pastor. And we got a lot of hirelings down in North Carolina. They're there for a paycheck and they couldn't care less. What happens to their sheep? Amen. You say, you're burdened about it? Yes, I am. I am. Not only that, folks, notice it says, neither see. Preoccupation with a lot of trash covers the eyes. It hides the enemy so he can come in, but it covers the eyes so you can't see them when they do come in. Amen. How about that? Not only that, look at this. Till we come in the midst among them and slay them. So much preoccupation with much rubbish slays the laborer. And when you get the laborer slain and you get them knocked out of church, you can't get the work done. We used to say down south that Nobody, no preacher likes to preach to the Wood family. And I'm not that there's a family here named Wood, but I mean a bunch of empty pews. Yeah. Nobody likes to preach to a bunch of empty pews. Amen. Do they? Amen. I mean, I like, I, folks, I preach to one or two people. And, but I mean, every, every, every preacher that preaches likes to have people here so they can hear it. Amen. Amen. Look at this. Loss of laborers severely hinders, even ceases the work. This Bible says that we are laborers together with Christ. We're laborers together. This Bible says there's a foundation that's laid that no other man can lay, and that foundation is Christ Jesus. And Jesus Christ himself said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So there's a job to be done for the Lord, and we've got to do it. If we don't, who is? Now let me ask you a question. I want everybody sitting here to look at the person beside you. All right, look at the person on the other side. All right, look at the person in front of you. Now turn around and look at the person behind you. <laughs> okay, now look at me. These are not your enemies. Amen. Amen. These are your comrades. These are your brothers and sisters. These are your buddies. These are your pals. Amen? Amen. You don't need to be fighting. Amen. Now listen, if you're the kind of person that absolutely this has to have somebody to fight, i got something for you. you got some new agers out here. They want to indoctrinate your children. Amen. you got some sodomites out here. They want to infatuate your children. Amen? you got some Muslims out here. They want to eliminate your children. Amen. So if you absolutely are the kind of person that has to fight somebody, there's you some enemies. Amen. It's not the people in here. Amen. Amen. Lastly, and I like this. 
course, I like it all, but I like the <laughs> listening for the trumpet brought unity. Mm. Are you getting that? Mm. What's next on God's calendar of events? The sounding of that trumpet, folks, that ought to bring us together, Amen. not scatter us abroad. Look at chapter 4, verse 19. And I said in the note, let's look at verse 18. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side. Here we go. You got your sword right here girded by your side. Y'all held them up. We do that for hold the four. You know, we sing hold the four. You got your sword girded right here. You got a King James Bible, you got a sword. If you got anything else, you got a butter knife or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Water pistol. <laughs> He that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles, to the rulers, to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. And we are, this is the name of the message tonight, by the way, separated upon the wall. That's the name of the message. Separated upon the wall. One far from another. In what place, therefore, you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. Ain't that good? Now let me tell you something, folks. There is a physical and a spiritual task for every believer. I don't care how insignificant you think you are. In God's eyes, you're not. Amen. You may not be the pastor. You may not be the pastor's wife. You may not be the Sunday school teacher or the deacon. But you still got a place in this church among God's people. You say, prove that. Okay, I will. Look down verse 16. Chapter 4, verse 16. And it came to pass... From that time forth that half of my servants rolled in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears and shields and bows and habergeons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which build it on the wall, they which bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands rolled in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders... Everyone had his sword girded by his side and so built. How about that? Amen. Amen. Folks, you may not be able to do the work, but you can pray. Amen. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Amen. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought of the obedience of Christ. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You can't, as a child of God, revenge disobedience until your obedience is fulfilled. I can't preach like I'm supposed to preach or teach the Bible like I'm supposed to teach if I'm disobedient myself. Because the Spirit of God won't move, won't work. Amen. I've got to be obedient to the Lord before I can help someone else with their disobedience. That's right there in the scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. And everybody can do that. Right? Amen. Folks, listen, we don't have a literal sword where we can go out here and, and, and cut our enemy up. Sometimes I wish we did. But we can't do that. Now you've got a, a group of about a, well, you've got two groups actually that, that believe they can do that. And that's what God ordained them to do, destroy people and physically and kill them with the point of the sword. Uh-uh. They're not Israel. Folks, this is not a theocracy we're in now. This is not dominion theology. This is not replacement theology. This is not covenant theology. And that's sweeping our churches in this country. Do you don't know why they're going back to the Geneva Bible instead of the King James Bible? Because the Geneva Bible is a Calvinistic Bible. There's 14 footnotes in that are pro-Calvinist. That's why they're trying to get rid of your King James Bible and go back to the Geneva Bible of 1560. Amen. Amen. Our God shall fight for the laborer and the prayer warrior. You say, all I can do is pray. What do you mean all you can do? <laughs> That's the first thing we're supposed to be doing. You've heard, and I've, I've been guilty of this myself, saying, well, all we can do is pray for them. And I'm wrong for saying that. I'm wrong. That ain't all we can do. That's the first thing we're supposed to do. But we say, well, I, you know, I can't, I, I don't have the money to give them. I mean, I can't, you know, all I can do is pray. That's the first thing we ought to do. 
Now look at this. The Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Not only that, Hebrews 6, 10. And I know what that's dealing with doctrinally, but spiritually, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and the labor of love. Now, 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 conclusion. What is the reason for that? What is all the fuss about? Why should Country Chapel Baptist Church, why, why should you be doing anything at all for God? Why? Do you know? Uh, you want to see souls saved, right? And the Lord glorified, right? Sure, sure, that's exactly right. But that's not the only reason. Take your Bible, look about it, Nehemiah 8. Reaching the lost for the glory of God. That's the purpose to serve by our obedience, by our unity, by our labor for the Lord Jesus Christ, reaching the lost, bringing glory to Him. But that's not all. Nehemiah chapter 8, look at this. Verse number 9. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, that's the governor, like we say a governor. And Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. You see that? You know they actually did that? You know something, when you come in here and Pastor Ireland preaches the Word of God to you and gives you Bible, you're not supposed to take it home and forget about it. You're supposed yeah. to take it out on the job, give it to somebody else that nothing's yeah. prepared out there. you got religious people all over this world that hear nothing, nothing when they go to church. They need to hear some truth. Amen. That's Amen. what this brother's doing on the website. That'll make you as popular as a ham sandwich at a Jewish wedding. I realize that. <laughs> but, but I know. I've been, in the, I've been in tour with these people for over 30 years. I know. Some of them are vicious. Vicious. And I begin to wonder if they even know God. Folks, if you can fight against this book and fight against this book and hate this book, despise this book, i got reason to doubt that you know God in this book. Amen. I'm not their judge, and thank God I'm not. But I wonder. I really do. I can only have a bad thought the Holy Spirit of God cleans my plow. I just wonder how in the world these guys can fight this book and, and cut this book yeah. down and, 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 and I mean, ridicule this book and people that believe this book and nothing ever happens to them. Yeah. I wonder. I really do. I wonder. I can't help but wonder. <laughs> now look at this. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites still all the people saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be grieved, be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat, to drink, and to send portions, and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Hmm. You know why the Dead Sea is dead? It's going to flow again. When the Lord splits the Mount of Olives, north and south, east and west, and that water's going to flow from the temple, it's going to flow into the Dead Sea and make it fresh again. It's, go, it's go, eventually going to be, it's eventually going to have sweet water. But listen, you know why the Dead Sea's dead? Because it has an inlet but no outlet. Yeah. And the water just turns to salt. And that's what's going to happen with a lot of Baptists. We take it all in, take it all in, take it all in, take it all in, but we never give any of it out. And so we die. Or we become introverted and stuck on ourselves. I don't want to do that either. I don't. Amen. So they actually did what they told them to do. Can you believe that? <laughs> they actually did it. They ate, they drank, and they took portions for people who didn't have anything. That's our job. Hey. But that's not all. Last reference, I promise. Amen. I promise. I, mean, I do. I promise. <laughs> I don't know how that's supposed to go. Don't it start here and go here, then here, then here. I think that's the way. I've never been a captain, so I don't know. <laughs> but look at this. Look at Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. And we'll be done. We do these things for others. Sure, it gives us some gratification. 
A lot of things we do as a child of God don't gratify us at all. We do it as a sacrifice for others. Before I got saved, I couldn't care less about anybody but me. I never had a spiritual thought or a spirit. I didn't have a spiritual bone in my body. Before I was 18 years old, I didn't have a spiritual thought. All I cared about was me. Every day that I lived was me. I can look back now and try to remember I didn't have a spiritual thought in my head. Nowhere. Until I got saved. But Nehemiah chapter 5. Look at it. Verse 9. He already started having trouble when he came back out of land. He said, also I said, it's not good that you do. Are you not to walk in the fear of our God? Look at it. Because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies. People are watching this church. They want to know if you're real. They are. They're watching. You don't know they're watching, but they're watching. Look at chapter 6 and we're done. So the wall was finished. In the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul. In 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were round about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. They'll look at country chapel Baptist church and say, I don't like them. They're a bunch of fanatics. They're a bunch of Bible thumpers. They're a bunch of hellfire and damnation preacher, but you got to say one thing: their God blesses them. Amen. And when they say that, they start investigating. That's why God would not allow the children of Israel, Old Testament, to mention the gods of Egypt, because when you mention the name, that brings interest. Interest brings investigation. Investigation brings experimentation. Experimentation turns into full-blown worship, and God knows human nature. People see Country Chapel Baptist Church doing a work for God. They may not like it. But I'll tell you one thing. They've got to admit God's in it. And God's in this place. And when they start thinking that, the Lord can work with them. He can soften that heart and He can get them saved. And that's what we're here for. Amen. 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 Separated upon the wall. Never let it be said. Never let it be said. You remember what David did with Bathsheba. Yes, the sin was put from him. He didn't die. He should have died because of what he did. He committed two capital offenses at least. And he should have died. But Nathan told him, he said, because you have caused the enemies of God to blaspheme, the sword not depart from your house. People watch and they see and they take an interest in what's going on in a local independent Baptist church. Amen. Don't ever be separated from one another, brethren. Be in unity. Amen. And God bless this church. You'll get a job done for God. And when you all stand at the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will say, well done, thou good and faithful servants. Amen. Amen, Amen brother. Turn to our red hills. Turn to hymn number 297. My Jesus, I love thee. You know Lord mine. As we say, if you need to do business with the Lord, the altar's open. Why don't you come? 